Hi, everyone. It's Cindy here, and I have Steve with me, Bolin, that I interviewed before, and his friend Jody. Um, Steve and his family, and Jody and her husband lived in the same lake house uh, complex at Dinosaur Adventureland. So they knew each other very well, and they all left together after um, what I just found out. I didn't realize this because Kent lied on YouTube and said that uh, he booted them out because they were lazy. The reality was that they were seeing cult-like behaviors and they didn't want to be part of it. And um, so we have so much to share. We're going to have a hard time staying on track. So if, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with that meeting. Uh, I believe it was April 9th, 2020, the meeting with um, seven witnesses. I just found out Jody's husband was one of them, and I knew that I was forgetting someone, but I didn't realize it was him. So this is the meeting where Kent Hoban accused Cindy of lying and that Steve did not give pot to Kenny and Timmy and that Cindy had an agenda to get rid of Steve and that Steve was telling the truth. So Kent called a meeting because I said, nobody here on this campus would believe that I'm lying. Everybody knows me better than that. And so he said, okay, let's call a meeting. And so seven witnesses showed up, Jody's husband, Freddie, Manon, Kenny, Timmy, and Julie. And they all said, we've known Cindy for two years, three years, whatever it was, and we've never known her to lie to us. But Steve, on the other hand, lies all the time. And Kenny and Timmy, who Steve had given them the pot, they're all, we know he's lying. He gave it to us. So I'm sitting there with seven witnesses telling Kent that his wife is telling the truth and that Steve is lying. And rather than vindicate his wife, Kent calls Ernie. Ernie, the yes man, the Guido. And Ernie says, Kent is like Moses. And I, Ernie, am his mouthpiece, Aaron. And Cindy is Cora. And all you seven witnesses are joining Cora's rebellion. And you know what happened to Cora? The earth opened up and swallowed him down. And everybody there was basically told, I know, their seventh person was Mark Stoney. Everybody there was told that if they helped me, if they talked to me, if they texted me, if they continued to say that I wasn't lying, if they talked about this matter any further, they would be kicked off campus. So from that point on, everybody was scared of being homeless kicked off campus, everybody was scared to talk to Cindy. And um, Jody's husband, well, that's when I, okay, and then Kent Hoban closes the meeting in prayer. And I just couldn't bear the betrayal, the hypocrisy, the slander, the false accusation, the just annihilation of my character. And so I basically, ran home screaming, ran home screaming at the top of my lungs. And that's when Ernie Land and Kent Hoban and Steve Lynn started the lie that Cindy was bipolar in order to discredit my witness because they're covering up. There's a giant cover up going on at Dinosaur Adventureland for Steve involving drugs and God only knows what else, a money grab, I don't know. But Cindy had to go under the bus for the cover up. And so I'm having witnesses here. So Jody, um, why don't you go ahead and start by sharing what, er, what your husband told you about that meeting? Because you were not there at the meeting. Well, I was going to go to the meeting, but I had was having difficulties with my feet, so I stayed home. Eddie went in, um, in lieu of us as a as a couple, and. He, when I remember at one point while he was gone, I heard you screaming and hollering, crying, 
running to your cabin from the direction of the cafeteria. Shortly after that, my husband came home and I asked him what had happened. And he said, you won't believe what they did to her. He said, Kent called Ernie, had him on speakerphone in front of everybody that was there, all the staff members. And Ernie told Cindy from the phone that if she didn't like the way that things were run, that she needed to keep her mouth shut and keep her business, keep uh, mind, in, mind her own business, or else she could leave just like any of us, uh, uh, any of the staff could. Um, my husband told me he said he never in his life ever thought that he would hear something like that. What man has another man tell their wife something like that? He felt that if, you know, had it been a situation where he and I were involved in something like that, there would be no way that anybody would talk to me or about me like that, not in front of him. But Ken Hogan was perfectly fine and happy with it. And he was just appalled at the way that you were treated that night. And that kind of gives me cold chills to hear that because that's almost identical to a story I had with Melissa whenever Cindy told me she wasn't allowed to talk to anyone. And I went back and told her like, what this is fishy something weird's going on what kind of a man forbids his wife from talking to anybody she's pastor's wife right right this is very odd right. so to hear that almost the same conversation going on between you and your husband it's just it's sad well what what i remember about the situation the most was is that you know i was raised as a pastor's uh, daughter mm -hmm. Um, my father pastored the church, and all my life, the men went to the pastor, and the women went to the pastor's wives. Mm -hmm. as, me, as far as me personally, I felt more comfortable going to Miss Cindy and with any, any issues or problems that I had, but not just on one occasion, but on several different occasions, and one occasion also being a text message, which I deleted and later deleted, but Doc came to my husband and myself and he said no longer were we allowed to gossip mm -hmm. or talk to the other staff members and we were under no circumstances allowed to go to Cindy with anything concerning the ministry concerning each other with nothing suppression of information right we we weren't allowed to talk to Miss Cindy at all Suppression of information and the wrongful accusation of gossip, backbiting, sowing of discord, when in reality, you're just talking. Well, that's Kent's, that's Kent's MO. He's a spin doctor. If, yes. if his doctorates are real at all, it's in spin. Amen. And suppression of information to him is going to be relabeled as gossip, as causing strife or whatever he has to call it to make you feel like you're not being a good believer. We may, we were made yes. to believe that we were the issue mm. by Kent Hovind. Yeah. Um, you know, that's when, when we started talking to you and Melissa about why don't we see if we can find a place off of property that way we can be out of the center of everybody's, he said, she said. Mm -hmm. Um, because it was evident early on that there was a particular way that Kent wanted his, I would say, followers, because there was nothing short of a lack of term to call them, mm -hmm. um, sheeple. <laughs> um, his, you know, they drank his Kool-Aid. Yeah. I mean, it was George Jones all over again. And he, he told us what to think. He told us what to feel. He told us what to say. The thought police. Holy yes. The question um, is, why did it take me so long? I guess because I was heavily invested in it. Well, you, you were in love with this man. You were in love with the hologram. And yeah. he had you secluded from us for, for I'd say, half to the majority of the time right. my family was there. And you were there longer than mm -hmm. me. 
Like he had you set apart from us. When and, so and, you know, at one point I was asked to be Miss Cindy's personal assistant to help her with the planting and stuff like that. But then eventually I got came to and was told to don't just stay away from Cindy. Don't bother her. Don't talk to her. It's, you know, it's not her, it's not her place. It's not her business. Which I didn't understand then, but I understand fully now. It's because Cindy was quick to act on the situation and find a resolution where everybody was happy. We all loved her. He couldn't have that though. He needed the end biting, fighting between the co-workers as a great distraction. So we were all so concerned with each other's drama, we didn't see what he was doing to run the cult behind the scenes. Well, you know, that's like that's the, what I ended up, that's what I was asking was Jody, why was he telling people not to talk to me? Is it because I was a problem solver and he wanted to keep the problems? Well, not yeah. only that though, Miss Cindy. Or because um, it made him look bad, or because I was mad at him for allowing all this. For not dealing with problems. You told me earlier, you would come to him and say, Doc, can I have your ear for a minute? And he would walk off. And not, not, not right now. Yeah. Later on. And so people would come to me because I would help you with your problems and he would ignore your but problems. But he was, you know, he mainly did that. And I saw it. I don't know if anybody else saw it. I think Melissa felt the same way. That if you were a woman at Dinosaur Adventure Land, you were, you know, we were just low on the totem pole as far as need to worry about. Well, I can say as a man who was there, that's without a question the case. Uh, women to Camp Hoven are second class citizens with no questions asked. We were, we were, we were there to fulfill whatever it was that he needed to be done. Um, that's like when we decided as a group, the two, the two families of us, decided to leave Dinosaur Adventure Land. We left on our own goal issue. We weren't kicked off. We yeah. weren't, it wasn't because of drugs. It wasn't because of alcohol or laziness. It had nothing to do with anything other than we wanted to get out from the he said, she said crowd. We wanted to quit being the center of their attention. And Doc was making them, making us the center of attention. He wouldn't judge with a bipartisan uh, mind, uh, okay, let me hear what you have to say. Let me hear what you have to say and go according to that. No, he would listen to one side and one side only. And we were judged dry and executed. So that's actually the other reason beside what Steve just said, why he didn't want this problems solved. Right. Because he was trying to drive you out. He was using, by, by listening to that one person only and not listening to the other person's side, he was using that person to drive you out. Well, I think he did that to everyone, to make everyone there feel like they were on an island yes. by themselves. And there was just, he, he does what he can to take away all your hope, all your friendships, and morale. all your connections. Right. So because that you're by yourself in a closet in the dark until he needs you for like. I have to say this, the thing that made Dinosaur Adventure Land such the wonderful experience that it was at the beginning was it was because of Miss Cindy mm -hmm. and the other staff members. Right. We Cindy. received our Christian fellowship amongst each other. We weren't taught. We weren't led by Dr. Hoven. We were dictated to. We were told what to do, what not to do, what to say, what not to say. So when we moved out, it was like two days later, he calls me up on the phone and I was actually on my way over to Dinosaur Adventure Land to pick up the guys because they were still going back and forth and volunteering their time. And he said, why did y'all leave? Just, you know, he says, now, if it's Cindy's fault, just tell me, just go ahead and tell me that it was Cindy's fault and I'll do something about it. I said, what are you talking about, Doc? He said, Cindy's the reason why y'all left. I said, no, sir. Cindy has nothing to do with the reason why we left. You and you alone are the reason why we left. I said, because we're sitting down there. My my husband works. Uh, Her yeah. husband works like a like He's like like up at 4.30 in the morning, morning, and he doesn't stop until 8 o'clock at night. He works like two minutes. And for, for, for him to even, for Doc, your husband to even say that Steve that you were lazy when if Eddie was working Steve was working if Steve was working Eddie was working them two were side by side they were buddies 
Um, and they, and Dr. Hopin knew that all he had to do was go to one of them and say, I got an idea. Come with me and check this out. That was Doc's way of trying to get you to work on, on your days off on Saturday. Oh, oh, Sunday deal, and That's when you know to run. Right. right. And so, but then, okay, that's like, you know, the day that it, it was, and this was on a Monday. This was an off day, but Dr. Hogan at 4 a.m. Uh, calls down and comes knocking on Kevin's door. I got an idea, brother. Once Eddie and Steve go out there and do something on the roof of the science center, which is a high pitched roof, um, it's metal and it's also raining. My husband winds up falling through the roof of that structure, breaks a rib uh, and uh, bruises his kidneys, and he's in uh, dire pain. And the very next day, Dr. Hogan's knocking on the ca uh, cabin door saying, Brother, when you come in, I hate that this happened to you when you come in back to work. Um, well, and the other thing that your husband shared uh, with me recently was that, you know, when he's working his rear end off on a regular basis and one time Kent sees him resting, right? And he says, Hey, brother, this ain't a rest home. This is not a rest home. We were actually, we had been staying, uh, my husband and I had been staying in Cabin Four, which was right in the middle of Dramaville. Yeah. And we had the our cabin had two it's two sides to it, the A side and the B side. We were on the A side, and there was a single lady that was in the B side, or we'll say names, but we were having difficulties with this woman who was eavesdropping on my and my husband's personal conversations. And next thing you know, the whole campus knows about it. And well, they know more about what we're uh, what we're talking about than we know what we're talking about. So we literally, I literally felt like I was being bullied by her. And because I wasn't allowed to come to you and talk, I went to Manon and I told Manon what was going on and I was in tears and I, I felt like I was being bullied and that I wanted to die because of this particular person interfering in our personal relationship. So Manon called a meeting between me and the other lady and Dr. Hogan and Manon would mediate. And we tried to, uh, I offered suggestions, move us to another cabin, move her to another cabin, do something. And he didn't do anything. He just, he just swept it up underneath the rug. Well, now what kind of person is it that comes up to, that has somebody come up to them and truly distraught, evidently uh, distraught and, and heartbroken and going to and they tell me that they want to kill themselves and they feel, feel like they want to die because the person that I'm force feeding them is bullying them. He, he, did, he didn't do nothing. It just as soon as the meeting was over, he washed his hands of it and nothing else was ever said or done about it. Well, and, and touching on that, because this is something you mentioned earlier that I didn't even know about. And we lived together, right. we moved off property together, right. our families about when you first arrived and the conversation you had with Ken in the van going to get ice cream with Bill Sardi. Yes. Um, we, we were there. It was, we got there New Year's Eve night. Uh, and we, Doc decided he was going to have an ice cream party and we was going to go to the dollar store. Well, I, I volunteered to pay for the ice cream for everybody because I'm, we're so excited to be there. We just want to do the right thing, we want to, you know, be make part of Dr. Dr. Hogan. Yeah, we were part of our family. We wanted to make Dr. Hogan proud of us to make it to so that we, he would want us to stay. Mm -hmm. And we've made plans to be there forever and ever. Um, so anyway, on the ride to the store, um, we're talking about the fact that I am bipolar uh, and I've been on medication for 20, 25 years. And he asked me, would I be willing to come off my medication? Would I come off my medication if he could find me a natural regimen to take in, in lieu of the prescription via Bill Sardi? Drugs, via Bill Sardi. He even called Bill on the phone and I talked to Bill over the phone and he's trying to tell me what to take in, in place of this medication in place of that. And it was just a lot for me to comprehend over the phone and he was going to email me the list of, um, I was to email him the list of medications that I was taking, and he would tell me what to take in the place of it. Um, but he did, he did, he asked me, he said, 
would you be willing to come off your and uh, come off your medication medication that I didn't know it at the time but by just quitting cold turkey like I did I could have had uh seizures I could have caused died. a suicidal thought yes. right yes. right yes. so that was the point of that is when you were feeling suicidal because of the because of the other lady it just you know I'm sitting here thinking to him I said Doc you're wanting me to handle all of this and, and you know playing sober from prescription medicine I said the natural herb stuff isn't working there's some things that I need to take that are that require and he um said something about we would come down to hit, that's when we started working on the pavilion because we wanted out of cabin four away the from the house. other lady the lake and uh, we sketched out an idea for some uh, some space that was there at the pavilion that could be converted into a cabin mm -hmm. now uh steve and melissa and their family were already down there and it was perfect for us we'll just be we'll be next door neighbors and buddies and stuff like that so within a day it was yes. a dream we threw that cap right we threw it right right we were, right. So were already down there alone we were we, yeah, were, we were so excited to have you guys down there we built y'all you guys built that cabin within a day on day two we were moving our stuff from cabin four down yeah. there and I think it was like on the third day, y'all just said Doc decided he wanted to go ahead and extend the pavilion out mm -hmm. to add another couple more rooms so your children have a place of their own and, mm -hmm. and not right up underneath you. And it just so happened that Eddie had been sick and he was had been sick for several days, but he was working anyway from 4.30 in the morning till 6 o'clock, sometimes till 3 dinner. And um, I remember he wouldn't come to dinner. He, uh, we were just basically cleaning around the pavilion, relaxing, not you know killing ourselves because y'all just kill yourselves on your days off. And he comes down there and sees that we're talking and laughing and whatever. And he says, "This is not a rest home." And he told Eddie to get up and get up there to told you and Eddie to get up there to the uh, other cabin to help put up the drywall Freddy's there. Freddie's cabin. <laughs> and Steve just told him, said, Doc, we don't care for Freddie because Freddie's the one that's causing the drama. And yet you want us to go up there and work on his cabin. And he's, to, he's the one that's telling these lies about everybody. And Doc said, either get up there and work or y'all can get out and leave. And it was at, at that time after he left the pavilion, we uh as a as a group sat down and decided that we were going to take our monies and pull it together and find a place and we did within a week within a week we were gone yep. and i'm so glad you decided to do this with us today because you brought a lot of extra that i didn't even remember uh specifically the tile guys yes the tile guys we were um it was after we had moved out, mm -hmm. um, we were back, the guys, like I said, the guys were going wait, back and forth. Wait, before you tell that story, I wanna say something okay. here to our audience. We're not trying to do a Kent Hovind bash. It, it feels like it might feel like a Kent Hovind bash. And we are all hurt, um, upset, but primarily we are here because people from all over the world go to Dinosaur Adventureland with stars in their eyes. M many of us, uh, all, all three of us in the room right here, sold everything to move there for life. Thinking we, not for a hammock, not for a rest home, because we wanted to give our lives in service to the Lord. Right. We wanted to go there to work. And Kent Holman promises on YouTube, if you work, you get room and board. And we Part just, of the family. and it is, it was anyway, until he kicked everybody off. Well, he, we were family amongst each other. Kent Hovind was no part of that family. Right. right. He separated right. himself. He was better than us. But point being, we're trying to warn people. And right. particularly a point you brought up about your husband. He was a brand new believer. He yes. wanted to hear the word. And when he saw Kent Hovind's behavior, he got deeply, deeply disillusioned. Well, like this I mean, is not no Christianity. I want nothing to do with. right. As a preacher's daughter, I was always raised to believe that if we offend somebody's Christianity, then woe be unto us for putting that soul down. 
That's so now, my happy. husband had, had never been in church before, didn't never read the Bible. He'd never really been one to pray or anything else like that. And so when we got there, he was like a sponge, Miss Cindy. He was soaking up the word of God. He was soaking up the prayers and the testimonials and the, the devotion and the dedication from all those staff members. And, 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 and at first, Dr. Hogan was involved in everybody's life. But then as the newness wore off, then the disillusions started coming to light. And that's what crushes me. Is His somebody was like, destroyed yes. by Kent Hogan and Dinosaur Adventureland because of the things that went on there and continue to go on there. Well, you know, that being a stumbling block, whether willingly or ignorantly, uh, you know, for instance, telling new believers that if you're not reading the King James and the King James solely, you might as well throw your Bible out. I've heard him say this, and that's mind boggling to me, because if you don't comprehend the scriptures you're reading, you're not going to read it. It's going to be a dust collector. Well, and that's, that's like being me being, a stumbling block. That's like me being raised Pentecostal. We believe in speaking in tongues. And to have my new leader, my new pastor figure, put down speaking in tongues, it, it kind of hurt my feelings because that's the way I was raised and that's the way I still believe. That's yeah. how I felt when he would not allow me and Melissa to observe Shabbat. When he told me there was no way I could take off Saturday, even though I... I offered to trade him. I would work six days a week to have Saturday off. And he needed someone to work Mondays anyways. And everyone else was off. I thought it was a, a godsend. He, he would not agree to it because he knew that was my faith. He has a very huge issue with anybody on campus disagreeing with him. Right. He does not believe right. in freedom. So that's like, you know, the, the uh, Mark Stoney, he started a Bible study group in the mornings before work. That was, a, that was a blessing. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, it's like you, uh, Steve, and um, Jonathan Reif starting the um, prayer meetings yep. in the evenings after Bible study. We gained so much from that. But yet we that's were a real fellowship. That was the God. That's where the fellowship was. Yes. Was between the between the worker, the people that worked there, that was on staff there, and you could feel the love of God from these people. But it was just, it was so sad. It was heartbreaking to be discouraged because the volunteers there are people who genuinely love God. They want to serve in a ministry. They want to build the kingdom. And that's why when visitors come to Dinosaur Adventureland, they get flooded with the workers right. because the workers are what create that atmosphere. Right. It's not Kent Hogan. Well, and he tells us all, you know, when you see somebody new, speak, stop and speak to them, testify to them, share your story with them. Wow. Um, but the dude used to, he doesn't say that anymore. Talking about workers. Now, this is after we done moved out. Wait, I want to say one more thing okay. about this, because what you just said about Eddie mm -hmm. getting his spirit destroyed. Mm -hmm. OK, that's why we're doing this. Right. And that's why I was so adamant about Kenny and Timmy, because Kenny and Timmy were new believers also. And they came there specifically to be clean and to leave their old life behind. And they were being hurt and. Kent Hoven didn't give a dang. And I was going to stick up for what was right. Anyway, we don't want new believers going to Dinosaur Adventureland, thinking you're going to serve God, thinking you're going to grow in Christ, when in re and then have you be disillusioned. Get disillusioned, get devastated, get hurt. Right. Because Kent Hovind is not who he portrays himself. In me telling my story and Eddie's story as a new Christian can save somebody from being having their spirit destroyed from something like Dr. Hogan and Dinosaur Adventure Land. I don't, it's, it's a great concept. If the man would just give it back to God, God gave it to him to begin with. That's now, powerful what you just said. I mean, it's it's all pride thing for Dr. Hogan. You don't, 
I was always taught raised and raised up, you know, be boastful how much you spent for this and how much you spent for that. You be you be prideful on what God gives us and, and be thankful for anything and everything. And then we were, we were so thankful. And, and just watching my husband go from this sinner to this man who just loved God and was ready to, if God had told him to jump off that science center uh, and hit the ground running, he would have done it. But to have that, his soul crushed. He, he, his, his spirit was crushed by the activities that were going on and the things that Dr. Hogan was like, okay, you know, no problem. Kick it under the rug. Just shovel it, shovel it under the rug. You're nobody, you're nobody in particular. You're nobody important. And, and sometimes yes. he made you feel like you weren't That's important. That's what he said on. to me in the car the other day. And he said to me that when Kent said, well, this is not a rest home, it just, his stomach sunk, like he just gotten punched in the stomach because it made him realize Kent Hovind didn't appreciate how he had worked so hard. Mm-hmm. It made him realize um, Kent Hovind is willing to talk about him like that. Right. And that's what made him get up and go. It right. makes you, nobody going to treat me like that. It makes you realize that the value you thought Ken Hogan had on you was fake. Right. The whole time. It makes you wonder how much of Ken Hogan's talking to you was slip service. Yeah. Because if he, any, any man of God, any woman of God, any Christian, when they see somebody who is a new Christian, or a struggling Christian would do anything or say anything to uplift them and and make them encourage them. encourage them and and there was sometimes you know how your kids when they're little and they look at you and they you know they're not hungry because you just fed them breakfast but they're standing in front of the refrigerator wanting something else. It makes you, it's almost like what you would expect the way that Dr. Hogan was doing with Eddie and the other new Christians. I see you want something else, but, you know, I'm going to do not be that. And, you know, he, he referred to himself, to us, as pastor, okay, as a pastor then lead us. He ain't no pastor. He's a teacher, maybe, but he's not a He doesn't have a shepherd's heart. He presents himself as Moses, but he's actually Balaam. He's a prophet, but it's a false one. Um, And I I would would tell tell anybody us doing what the donkey did to Balaam. God made that donkey talk to stop Balaam from being foolish. He put that donkey in the road so Balaam would not go down the wrong road. He made that donkey talk for Balaam's sake. And God has put us, Mark, you, um, Jonathan, Paul, many, two Pauls, many, many people have been speaking to Kent Hovind. Mm -hmm. And he, just like Balaam, will not listen. Um, One thing I want to, one thing I want to clarify is because I know that Dr. Hovind gets a lot of his um, donations and his, um, from the community that watches his videos on YouTube. And I've sat in that YouTube room and listened to his Bible studies and everything every day, every night for the five months that we were there. And um, after we left, there was a um, Bible study done where he was talking about how he needed these particular workers, these particular types of workers to come and help him do things. And they were... Uh, the, the people that we met were from Texas. Um, it was a small crew of people that were laying tile yeah. at the pavilion in those cabins that we built, those rooms that we built, um, because it was all concrete floor. And, and we were there, I was there to come pick you guys up. And I walked in, walked through and seen what a wonderful job they were doing. Mm-hmm. And they were actually done for the day. They were packing up. I said, how many, how much longer do you think you'll be done before you're done? He said, we're done with what we're going to do today. We're going home now. We're loading up. And I said, oh, okay. So y'all are not going to finish. He said, well, because we were misled 
Um, they felt like they were misled that the agreement between them and Dr. Hogan was that they were going to come to Dinosaur Adventureland, that they would either donate their time and Dr. Hogan would buy their materials or vice versa. They would donate the materials and Dr. Hogan would pay for their time, which wasn't how it lived, came out to be. They felt like they were misled and disillusioned. And so they packed up and they left. And with the job not completed because they said there's no way that they would have came all the way from Texas for free. It makes you wonder how many times something like that was the case. I had an attorney ask me um, because I said I'm not the only one that he has financially screwed. And they said, do you have names of other people? And I started making a list. And it was like 20. I, I have no problem believing that. If, if these interviews could do anything, if they could stop people from selling everything they have to go serve in the ministry for life, only to be kicked off six months later with nothing more than a bus ticket and no destination, then these interviews served a purpose to protect God's sheep. The other thing is the sheep that do decide to go anyway um don't believe whatever he promises you and no. this was my mistake when i came in 2016 theo did try to warn me and uh two or three other people that were on campus at the time they said cindy if he promised you that rv uh don't believe him he does not keep his promises he does not keep his word and I came anyway, and sure enough, oh, uh, no, well, you can't have that RV. Um, and, you know, in the beginning, you have no idea the underbelly of Kent Hovind. And so you just figure, well, it was just a misunderstanding. Yeah, well, you know, that touches on another point. And I, I want people to understand this because he's always got new people at the beginning of his broadcasts, you know, guys, did your family love this place? Is this a cult? Okay, you guys see it for yourselves now. I want these people to understand three quarters of the people he's interviewing and, and verifying that it's not a cult have only been there a day. Or, and they, and they're, well, either that or just long enough to take the tour and leave. Right. The other quarter of the people would not admit it publicly anyways, right. because they know by 12 o'clock that night, they would be on a bus to nowhere. Or if you're someone like my husband and myself, who were so grateful for the opportunity the opportunities that were given to us by being there, we were willing to turn, turn a blind eye and a deaf ear. Yes. You know? And I think... I think that stands for a lot of newcomers that are there to live. They've got this grant, they've been given this grand illusion of something wonderful. And as time kicks on, the the, 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 the disillusionment just starts falling away. And the next thing you know, you're standing, standing there staring at something ugly and almost Demonic. I was thinking that the whole time. There is something very ugly and very downright demonic because only a demon wants to steal, kill, and destroy a new yes. believer. A pastor, and, and to suppress prayer groups in Bible studies, right. what godly influenced Moses we were would do that. We were gossiping. Don't you know that right. we hear Dr. Moven talk? We were all gossiping. Right. We were and, and you know, you touched on something so beautiful, Jody. Uh, you do, you start overlooking things that you're noticing because you just don't want to recognize it. You know, you, you want to overlook it to be there and help the kingdom grow. You to, and and this, any, this makes me this makes me think of you. You got that joy in your heart because you're fine, you feel like you're finally doing something that God, God and people can will recognize the good at. Yep. And it's just, it's all, a, it's all a show game. It's all a show game. It's uh, what is it, uh, three-card Monty? 
I think that's another reason why people turn a blind eye because they want the dream. I think that's what I was guilty of. I wanted the dream so bad. It's a beautiful place to live in fellowship with other believers, to be working for something that will hopefully impact the world. As long as you don't learn too much. Right. As long as you don't dig up too many skeletons and you're willing to overlook a lot. You, it's it's a wonderful of place as long as you are, are it, it would like say, for instance, with the, the speaking in tongue things, me being Pentecostal, it wouldn't have been so harsh to me had Dr. Herman would, uh, uh, would have been like, that's how you believe and encouraged me to believe the way I want to, but to tell me that I was wrong in believing Or to acknowledge that different people have different right, interpretations exactly. of this. When you start... Same with the Sabbath. When you start being told what to think, what to say, who to talk to, who not to talk to, that goes beyond a ministry yes. and to the cult. Yes. That's what Jeff was saying. Jeff was saying, my mind is free. Nobody's going to tell me what to think. You, you know, if what? your mind is not free, then that's when you start getting, you know, shown by Dr. Hogan and you know, like the best thing for you to do is just to, you know, walk away. When, when, when us four sat down at the pavilion that night after Ken had said what he said, mm -hmm. and we decided that we were going to pull our resources and get the hell out of Dodge. Mm -hmm. The joy that overcame all of us. We couldn't stop giggling. Oh, like we were drunk in the spirit. We, we were, were so happy that we were going to be free. We rented a place sight unseen and we spent 12 hours of steady elbow grease cleaning from top to bottom. But we were so happy and God was blessing us. Yes. We didn't I know. Also, it was. I want to point out that while Kent was on his YouTube channel saying you guys left because or he kicked you out because you were lazy and drug addicts you were still coming right. to volunteer without getting the room and board that kent promises we you already paid your, your own room and board and you were still showing and up. that the guys were still and well melissa and i would go every every other day Take to her room, room and the cafeteria and you guys were going back and forth every day. And that was okay by him. But it, was it was okay that's something, wasn't good enough. That's something that proves that you were not lazy and that he doesn't appreciate. He could, you know, if there's there's not but what two people that are still there. That we that we knew then. If that is Freddie and, and Monroe, that's, that's the other thing. thing. Those are the only I two think people. those are the only two still there. That's and the other if, thing that I really want to point out is he gives you the false uh, promise that you'll be able to stay there for life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As long as you're a good he said, worker. Give it a week first. See how we match you. We like and you then like us. you realize that he really doesn't want that because it's. It's a lie. He's lying to you. Where he tells you you can come sell everything and you can stay here for life, brother. It's a lie because a lie. once you figure out what's going on, he doesn't want you anymore. And there's always fresh blood coming in. You got to understand, people, when you go to Dinosaur Adventureland, you've never been there before. First of all, we all know that Dr. Hogan is a um, well known, he's a famous person. Yes. And so a lot of people go there with these star, stars in their eyes. Oh, I'm finally using, yeah. I'm finally getting to meet the great Dr. Hogan. Yep. But let me tell you, people, that Dr. Hogan is the same as you and I. He is nothing great. Actually, he's a heck of a lot worse than you and I. Yeah. Yes, you and I don't. But you know what? He's not going to show us. The true colors are not going to sh show at first. The longer you're there, the more you see, the more that, that that what's going on around you begins to open up, and you hear, you know, you share stories with the other yes. team members to make sure you're not the only one that is seeing things this way or understanding things this way. Um, all I can say is that I'm grateful for the experience, but I'm also grateful that the good Lord gave me two eyes to see them. I remember being in shell shock by catching him in so many lies. 
Well, that's like the, you know the Steve Lynn story with the with the drugs and and the drug tests. And my husband and I we took two drug tests while we were there. The one that you and and Timmy and Steve had y'all type of mouth swabs and stuff like that. We were there then, but our you know I think my Eddie's I know our both tests we took turned out you know negative. We weren't not on anything. But then when we had the meeting with the same people who had been um, taking the drug tests, along with Steve Lynn, you, Dr. Hoven, Freddie was there as well. There was but just a handful of us. Joe was there. And are you talking about the meeting where Steve, Steve quit? says, yeah, he quit. And can, can you add anything to that that maybe we forgot? Wait, let me just give up under a context, okay? So in the YouTube room, mm -hmm. before Kent did his nightly Bible study, there mm -hmm. were probably 20 of us in there. Mm -hmm. And Kent Hoven gave Steve the ultimatum. You either take a drug test or adios. Right. But I actually think it was probably a show. I don't know. I've never seen Kent stand up to Steve like that. But anyway, Steve did say, oh, this is effed up and he got up right. and he got, he got very angry he got a cop in attitude and he said i quit if you think that i need to be taking a drug test like he's uh, he made us feel like that he was even better than we were well i think he, he always referred, does that he, i think he, he referred to us as a bunch of homeless people right right which is crazy because, because most of us not people, all are homeless to not, be homeless not people homeless druggies yeah that's yes. right homeless right. druggies but i do <laughs> remember how lived it. Oh, wait a minute who was just arrested and uh, on a hallucinant? Uh, what is Steve Lynn for five hundred? <laughs> <laughs> Who was it that made a midnight trip to DAL to? Yeah, that's on my I laughed so hard at that midnight tour. The, the midnight tour. Who does that? Now, the a drug thing, addict. The only a drug thing addict. That, and you can tell by the way he was talking that he was hot on something. Yes. But what gets? Do you remember Steve when we were down in the pavilion? All the nights that, and this is back before Steve Lynn got the um, Jeep, he had that red little red car, yeah, and he was putting around the pavilion, at night. pavilion at night, checking the deer we camp. Are, he had like, cameras set up down well, there watching the pavilion. And we're almost positive that he put a bug down at the pavilion because he had already confirmed to me in a text message that he bugged the place. Right. And after we moved down there, Kent started sending people down there to talk to us and question us about private conversations. That us had. Have known. And you right. know how far the pavilion is from camp. So there's no yeah. way these people had heard these conversations. Right. Not, unless, they heard not unless they came down there specifically to spy on us. Yes. But and there was a lot, you know, that's like, you know, when I went to Ernie. And mentioned to Ernie about Steve got the deer cams because Steve admitted to us at one time that he had deer cams down there. He just wanted to protect the ministry and make sure nobody was doing illegal drugs on the property. Anyone but him. That's Everybody. called projection. Right. Um, but you know, we would say we would witness this, and and the, he and it was kind of, it came to our attention that he had mentioned something to one of the other staff members that there was a bug, a camera placed. Around about Kevin Four, Freddie Manon's cabin, Mark around Stoney. there. Mark Stoney, as, as a member of he said, Yeah, that we were being bugged because a lot of people like to congregate on our porch after church. On, uh, on that is so sick. Night, and he would be he would be watching us. And I told uh, Ernie about this. He said, Now, um, video, there's nothing wrong with video and audio surveillance in common areas. I said, The front porch of Kevin Four is not a common area. And that's something that people who visit need to know beneath the shadow of doubt. You will not go there to visit or stay and have any level of privacy. You are being listened to, and there's watched. a very high probability that you're being watched, even in your most intimate moments in the privacy of your cabin or wherever you're at, you're being watched. And, and it's then, not just you, your and wife. It's and, not so, and it's not so much as maybe... It could be coming down from home office. It could be coming from Dr. Hogan. I, I think a lot of it has to do with the paranoia from Steve Lynn himself. Steve is paranoid. And Ken yeah, and Ernie and are afraid. wrapped around his baby pinky. Well, that and the, the false illusion that there is a board. Okay, there are 
a certain amount of persons that make up a board, but right. they're nothing more than a group of yes men for Ken Hoven. Mm -hmm. If Ken Hoven says do this, it's going to happen. We've always called Steve Lynn cash cow. He's not going anywhere. We often wonder if Steve Lynn's got a little calf. The golden right. calf. But, you know, it's like, okay, if we know, Cindy, if you or you, Steve, or myself, or anybody that works there, were to steal from the tens of thousands of dollars from the ministry um, and do the things that Steve Lynn has done and still carry a key to the office door really blows my mind. And donors need to know. Supporters of Dinosaur Adventureland need to know that they have an active criminal working on their board and handling their monies and their videotapes and, and stuff. he's an I outside vendor. Oh, well, garden I'm sorry and... he's not an outside <laughs> vendor. Yeah. If so, that be the case, then, then my husband was an outside vendor. Kent will yeah. say that he is not on the board, but he has all the passwords, all well, the bank account information. He gets the mail. Well, he, and he gets all the checks. I have notes. heard from a birdie audio with Kent asking Steve to be on the yes. board. I still have access to it. So yes. Kent can say That's whatever he wants, them. but just like every other situation, Kent is a liar. If well, Kent's ever told lie. the truth, it was on accident. Well, when he will lie Steve, using a truth. When so for example, out, hold on, I'm sorry. Even if he is not on the board, he still asked him to be on the board and he asked all the active board members, Ernie, um, should we put Steve on the board? Oh, yeah, brother, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Jay, uh, uh, Bill Sardi. Mm -hmm. Now, Kent, you'll notice on that audio, didn't give Bill Sardi a chance to answer. He just basically informed him. Right. Well, well you know, Alex Steve, that's like the, the day that, 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 you know, Steve Lynn, we, a doc told Steve Lynn he was going to take a drug, drug test and he could leave. And he says, don't have to worry about it because I quit. I remember standing, walking down the steps of the YouTube room right beside Doc. And he's on the phone with Ernie Land and he's telling Ernie what just transpired. And Doc said, I, t I told him that, you know, he was fired. And Ernie's like, no, do what you got to do and get him back. Are which you is, kidding me? No, yes. which is interesting because like three days after What's that. What's the matter with this man? Ernie, See, Ernie is in business with Steve. Ernie came in like three days later. And I, I don't know if you were in the Cindy, but you were in the meeting when mm -hmm. Ernie came in and told us point blank, the ministry would go under if we lost Steve. Right? Which is so stupid. How many people have come and gone that are totally able to do tests? I have all the passwords to all the accounts, bank accounts, all that information. And for him to be in charge of that still is mind blowing to me. Yeah. The people, it doesn't matter what Ernie Land says, it doesn't matter what Ken Hogan says, it doesn't matter what Steve Land or any uh, Bill Sardi or none of them say. People, please understand that the money that you are donating to this ministry is being handled and ran and the password protected by a man who just was arrested uh, uh, for car theft and drugs. And a confession and he, and, and to and he embezzling tens of thousands of uh, dollars from the ministry. Tens of thousands of dollars from the ministry. Now, Your not only that, probably never made it to the ministry. Probably landed up in Lynn, uh, that's Lynn's correct. Well, or that's Ernie's. because they tell you to make all your checks out to CSE, and what they don't tell you is that there is a CSE Incorporated, there is a CSE Ministry, and then Steve Lynn's personal tech business is also labeled as CSE. So when you write your checkbook out and you give up a meal to send ten dollars to Kim Hogan, right? It could be cashed in any of the three accounts, right? And I just discovered a fourth entity. Wow. Um, CSEM Inc. Wow. So CSE Inc. CSEM M standing for Ministry, and CSEM Inc. And you don't make your check payable to any of those. You and only this, make your check payable to CSE, which doesn't right. specify which one. one. And then again, Steve's personal which business is, is CSE. Creation Science Evangelism Technologies, and, which would be CSE. 
So just be careful. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna donate money and pay tithe, give it to a widow or an orphan. But if you just feel this overwhelming need to give it to CSE, then specify on your check that it's for the ministry so that it doesn't go in Steve Lynn's bank account or Kent Hogan's bank account and get squandered. I don't, I don't think, I don't think memoing your check for the ministry is going to make a difference to Steve Lynn. If he wants your money bad enough, all he's got to do is shovel it. And, but I'll do one just pretend like this check didn't even come in. I'll slide it over oh, to my hypothetically, account. Yeah, hypothetically, hypothetically right. steal from the cash right. box like right. he legitimately stole from the cash box. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, I, just, it's, it's, it's something, I mean, did, did Dinosaur Adventure Land has a great ministry behind it. If you could just find the yes, right person to run it. Yes. If you found a real Moses, that place would prosper. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would take this information, give it to the right ears, save people from getting hurt, um, save your money that is your tithes to go to a real ministry where greed is not the ruler and where there's no evil underbelly. We all have sin, Lord, but this is actually particularly grievous, Lord. Please just use this. Um, for your glory, Lord. We want to defend your ways and your honor and how you want people to be treated. Either one of you want to pray? Yeah, I will. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you would keep a humble heart on us and let none of this be out of retaliation or from the hurt that he caused any of us, but let it be with the heart of mourning our brothers and sisters and preventing them from feeling that hurt yes, and, and just allowing us to help protect your sheep and, and giving us the opportunity to tell the truth because you won't hear much truth from, from the other side. And we just pray that you would always guide our steps and that you would be our, our guiding light. And we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. Oh, is he? Yeah. You want to just do that?